Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode. I am very, very excited for you guys to dive into this juicy conversation that I had with Courtney. We've been following each other for a while. She does the most incredible Instagram reels. So I would really recommend that you go check them out. She goes to grocery stores and whatnot and basically breaks down the shit in the food here in America. So it is epic. This conversation is super eye-opening. I hope that it inspires you guys to take radical responsibility of your health and to realize that if you don't give your health time now, you will be giving your illness time. So don't forget that the Men and Money Bundle is closing this week please in a few days time. So please make sure that you have grabbed your space. If you would like to join us, if you have any last minute questions, please quickly email them over to us. And don't forget to leave a review on the episode and send me a screenshot of the review. The details are below so I can send you that meditation that I give you guys in return. And let's jump in. I hope that you enjoy. Okay. I love this. I love this. Let's just dive straight in. So Courtney, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to be doing this conversation with you finally. Um, For those of you that don't follow Courtney, you absolutely need to because you do the most amazing videos on Instagram. And I just really want to validate that for you because I know that so much time and energy goes into filming all of them. And then you have to approve them and edit them and write the caption and just like a lot goes into it. Um, And they're incredible and amazing. And it really brings to light for a lot of people, the crap in food. And I actually, since, and you know what we definitely should talk about today is like helping somebody transition. Cause I know that you were sharing on your Instagram about like getting healthy things for your boyfriend. And I went through the same kind of thing. And in actually meeting my, um, now fiance, it made me really aware that it's a pure lack of education in especially the U S you know, European countries, Australia, et cetera, like they kind of don't even have to be educated because there isn't really unhealthy options there at large. Um, everything just already kind of is healthy. But I grew up in a in a pretty healthy household. My parents are, you know, that they live in Australia and whatnot. And it's just the eating of like eat real food, like meat and veg, you know, like simple, clean, healthy. You cook with olive oil. Why would you cook with anything else? It's, you know, that kind of thing. And then I met him and what I, what really fascinated me was there was the intention to be healthy and eat healthy, but the execution wasn't there. And it's that classic greenwashing, you know, they think that they're being healthy, but they're actually being really, really unhealthy. So let's just dive straight in. I have a list of questions for you, which I'm really excited to get into, but do you want to give everybody like a little bit of an intro and kind of how you got to this place of being really passionate on debunking all of the health confusion out there for people? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, We just recorded an amazing episode for my podcast and I also really love following you on Instagram. So I'm just honored to be here. So thank you. Um, I started uh, my company, my business, Real Foodology, 12 years ago when I was getting my master's of science in nutrition and integrative health. And at the time it was just a food blog. I was sharing recipes and just kind of random tidbits about health that I had been learning on my journey of health that I felt like people didn't really know. And that's really what sparked my my passion was, you know, I've always, um, I'm a Virgo and I'm a very classic Virgo where I, I have this deep desire to help people. And, you know, oftentimes Virgos go into like healthcare as like nurses or whatever, you know, some sort of professional like that, profession like that. And, and I very much resonate with that. My whole life, I've always in some capacity knew that I wanted to help people, but I didn't really fully understand until I started learning about nutrition. And I became very passionate about it when I was in college. And then I ended up going on a different route where I was working in music for a long time, which I'd mentioned before we were recording. And then my passion became so strong, um, mostly because what I started reading about was about our food industry and just how duped we are in this country, because we allow um, money, we allow profit over the Mm. health of our people. We allow lobbying in Washington. Uh, We allow these large corporations to... Um, not keep our health in mind when they're creating these products. Uh, I think a lot of people have this misconception in the U.S. that if it's on the shelf, that it's safe and okay to eat. But what's happening is we're allowing these companies to govern and regulate themselves because, you know, thankfully, because we have this amazing market where, you know, anyone can start their own business and put a product out, which is a really cool thing about the U.S. But the problem is, is that we have so much of this going on that, the FDA, the USDA have admitted that they can't fully regulate all this because there's so much happening. There's so many foods, so many things going on the shelf. So what's happened is um, this responsibility has been put on us as, you know, the American consumer, you know, in in 
you know, American public that we have to do our due, due, due diligence and really figure out what's healthy and what's not. And the problem mm. is, is that, um, you know, these large corporations, they put so much money into marketing budgets that they completely confuse them, the public into thinking that certain products are healthy for them. And, you know, a really important thing for people to know that in America, there's 11 companies that own the entirety of our food system. 11. Wow. That's yeah. That's actually fucked. Like that's a monopoly. That's not a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it should be illegal. And, you know, we have situations happening here in the U.S. Uh, you know, we talked about this earlier that you have a large audience that are in Australia and in mm. um, Europe. So because we are not as regulated as people might think um, in other countries, like, for example, in Europe, or let's say specifically in the U.K., Kraft Macaroni and Cheese had to reformulate their macaroni and cheese because we in America use certain ingredients in our Kraft Macaroni and Cheese that is banned, um, certain ingredients that are banned in the U.K., so what happened was Kraft reformulated their macaroni and cheese. They sell it um, in the UK, a healthier version of it. And then here in the US, we get the crappy one because one, it's not regulated and we allow these products into our food, but also because they can get away with it and it's cheaper. It honestly makes my blood boil because, you know, the what makes me so sad is people that are not educated. They don't care. They frankly don't care. They're like, it's cheap. You know, and we, you know, especially more so in the US, the the gap between the wealthy and the poor is very large. And so you have these people that can't afford healthy food and healthy foods now become more expensive when it used to be the other way around. You know, yeah. like I know from like my mom would say all the time when I was a kid, it was cheaper to be healthy and it was more expensive to go to McDonald's. And now it's the other way around. And these poor kids they have no control and no say over what they're putting in their mouth. People are also so used to feeling shit that they don't even know what it feels like to feel good. But I mean, the whole thing of like so many things being banned, how many is there? Isn't there like 3000 things that are banned in other countries, but allowed in the U S or something? Yeah, it's something like that. I don't know the exact number, but it is really, really large. I actually remember, so I used to work for a Swedish pop star and we, so she spent the majority of her career before we met touring around Europe. And then when she hired me on, um, her and her band, they were all Swedish, had just come over more recently to America. And they, it was so interesting to see America and Amer the American food system through their eyes, through these European eyes, because they were just blown away by the stuff that we were able to sell here. You know, like we'd be on the bus and a, a commercial would come on for like, I don't know, like the cheese filled crust or something oh, Domino's piled like this high. And they would just be like, this is literally illegal in Sweden. Like we don't even sell foods like this. They don't even allow these kind of foods into our food system. Well, even beyond that, in, so in Australia, like what blew me away is when I, when we would come here like for holidays and stuff, and then also now living here more so when you're watching like normal TV with ads is that you're allowed to do ads here for like the pill and stuff. Yeah. And then at the end, it's like, may cause death. I'm like, what the fuck? And then people still go on the pill, but it's like, may cause death. Well, in Australia, you don't even, you're not even told that it may cause death, but there at least isn't advertisements on the, the mainstream media about going on the pill. But just like, you know, even when I go to, when I go to Europe and stuff, we were saying before that I will eat, I mean, I'm celiac, so I can't eat gluten anyway, but I will eat literally every bit of cheese and I will not even look at cheese in America because I will get bloated strangely just from looking at cheese. And, you know, I will, I'm not worried about the skincare there. If I, like one time we were, we flew to Rome and our bags were like delayed or whatever. So I had to just go to Sephora and I got, you know, the cleanest stuff that I could, but I even knew that it, I knew that it didn't even have half the shit that is allowed in America. So I felt a bit better about using it. And we all wonder why Europeans aren't all, you know, dead, sick and obese. And I'm like, well, for one thing, they have a healthy lifestyle beyond the fact that like they, you know, have more holidays and they don't stress as much, et cetera, et cetera, but also the food system. So, okay. First question is what are some of the ingredients and foods that people often don't realize are so bad for them, but are in foods? And if you can, after that, if you remember, I want you to talk about natural flavors. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I would say first and foremost, seed oils. I think more and more mm. people are starting to understand this now. Um, 
this is something that I've been talking about for probably 12 years now because my mom was the one that first pointed that, this out to me that we should not be consuming canola oil. Now, at the time, I knew forever to avoid canola oil, but more recently, as more studies have come out and we've started to dig deeper into this, we've started to realize that it's seed oils in general. So what is a seed oil? Mm. So um, canola oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, rice bran oil, uh, soybean oil, and corn oil. Now, the problem with these oils is that, um, first of all, you think about like, let's think about uh, getting the oil from an olive versus the oil from a sunflower seed. If you just press on an olive, the oil comes out you know, very easily, pretty much immediately. The sunflower seed, it has to go through an entire processing in order to get oil out of that tiny little seed. Because if you were just to press that seed with your fingers or even like through a machine, you're barely going to get any oil out of that. So there's an entire extraction process that happens, not to mention, now we're not saying that sunflower seeds are unhealthy for you, but when you're consuming sunflower oil, it's as if you're consuming, I don't know, like 500, 500 sunflower seeds in one sitting that you could never consume yourself. So the real problem mm. with these oils is that we're getting such a high concentrate of uh, omega-6s and omega-3s in those seeds that we would not normally get. It's an, un, it's an abnormal amount that we are consuming. Whereas like olives, for example, like I said, like, you know, our, our body is used to having that kind of oil and they're just more, they're more naturally oily. And they, also and like, they don't have to go through like a bleaching process. And, you know, like when there's a really great book called um, Deep Nutrition, I don't know whether you've read it. It's huge. And just like, I read it years ago. And the fact that with like vegetable oil and seed oils, it has to go through literally a bleaching process and it turns into gasoline yeah. before you eat it. I'm like, do you go to the petrol station and put that thing in your mouth? No. So don't eat the same shit, right? Like it's so inflammatory. It's so bad. But unfortunately, it is oil. like so – it's so widely used. Yeah, and that's because it's cheap. Um, and, yeah, it's cheap. Honestly, it's cheap it, is yeah. really the main reason that it's being pushed right now. And I think for the longest time, we didn't fully understand, like, I, I want to give some, you know, businesses the benefit of the doubt that a lot of people didn't fully understand how bad it was. But now, you know, as we know, and the science is starting to come out, they don't want to change the oils because unfortunately, yeah, it is more expensive to eat healthy in this country. But what people don't understand is that we don't really truly understand what the true cost of food is. The reason why mm. some of these foods are so cheap, like, let's say, for example, fast food, um, although I will, I'll go now, I'll explain this in a second. Okay. Um, in more depth, but fast food is actually not as cheap as we once thought. Um, it's getting more and more expensive, but you have to reframe your brain to think about it differently. Yeah, it may be cheap in the moment at the cash register, but you are going to pay infinitely more later in doctor bills, in medicine, potentially beyond pharmaceutical drugs for life, uh, your insurance, your healthcare costs. You are going to pay so much more later on down the line, but the problem is, is that we're seeing the immediate effects, you know, on our finances at the cash register, but you're also paying for it in your health. You know, I try to tell people this all the time. I'm like, it's not necessarily about living till you're a hundred. It's more about like, you know, having energy to live your yeah. life for the time that you're on this planet. Do you want to have energy to show up for your job? And also if you have energy and your brain is functioning better and you don't have brain fog, you're going to be better at your job. You're probably going to make more money. You're also going to have energy to show up for your family and to play with your kids, to do the things you'll have you a libido so you can have you'll great have sex. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, we're paying for this um, in so many other ways. So yeah, it's quote unquote cheaper, but it's honestly not even that much cheaper on my podcast. My mm. producer and I have a series called organic for everyone. And we started remaking famous or like really popular fast food items. Like we did cheesy gordita crunch from Taco Bell. We bought all the ingredients that um, we needed to make cheesy gordita crunch at home. Everything was organic and it was cheaper to buy it at the grocery store, all organic than it was to go through the drive-thru. That's really interesting. I think also for a lot of people is it's like, when when people are eating takeout all the time and fast food, it's, you know, it's $10, $15 20, here or there. Whereas going to the grocery store is like a hundred dollars or $200 for a whole week of food, let's say for one person. And that seems like more, but when you actually add up eating takeout all the time, it does become more expensive. Yeah. And also like, I mean, we don't, I don't want to get too much into this, but like, we don't value cooking at home anymore. 
we're so obsessed with doing our job that it's like, we don't want to take 30 minutes to cook. And it's like, if you don't want to take 30 minutes to look after yourself, like, I'm sorry, but like, can't help you. (laughs) And also your job is going to suffer. Like I said, if you do not put yourself and your health first, nothing else in your life is going to go as well as it should. And it's going to show up someday. Maybe it won't show up in a year, but there's going to be a day where you're like, I regret eating so badly because I could have prevented this. And like, I would hate to be 50 and regretting my choices because they were quick and cheaper, but not in the long term. Exactly. Oh, and I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent, but what I was trying to say is that too, we don't understand here in the US, we don't actually know what food truly costs because we pay subsidies to farmers to grow certain specific foods in order to make them cheaper. So that's why initially things like fast food were a lot cheaper. And some of them still are in some cases because we pay farmers a subsidy to grow corn, wheat, and soy. And what that means is that it offsets the cost a little bit, although it comes out of our tax dollars. So we're still paying for it, you know, one way or another, but as a result, it means that these crops are cheaper, but it's also why they're in literally everything. So corn, wheat, and soy Mm. are what we're paying subsidies on the most. So they're cheaper. So it's why they're, you know, if you pick up any box of processed food, you'll look on the back and it most of the time says may contain corn, wheat, and soy. And then you think about like, let's break down like a fast food meal, for example. Okay. So the cows were fed corn and soy. Um, That bun probably, it definitely has wheat in it. It most likely has corn syrup. Um, And then in the cheese, again, those cows were fed the corn and soy. So every single ingredient pretty much in all those fast food items contain corn, wheat, and soy. And it's because it's really cheap to produce. Oh God. Okay. So coming back to some of like the ingredients that we should look out for. So seed oils, number one, natural flavors, I know can be a tricky one. So can you quickly explain natural flavors, at least for like the U S yeah. So natural flavors are not necessarily inherently bad for you. The problem is, is what so many people have an issue with it is that it's an umbrella term and it could mean so many different things and we don't actually know what they are. And a lot of people argue for them saying, well, it's protecting the proprietary blend, you know, for this company or whatever. But the problem is, is that, uh, so we have natural flavors and we have artificial flavors and the FDA regulates these based on what they deem to be natural and artificial. There's a lot Mm. of things under the natural flavors umbrella that many of us that are trying to better our diets and eat cleaner would not consider them to actually be something that's clean because unfortunately the word natural is not actually regulated. So someone can say, oh, my product is natural, but then it has, um, like there's an additive that's under natural flavors that comes from beaver anus. And it's I've heard about this. It comes from a Just, beaver when I, when I pick up a tea bag, like, and it says natural flavors, if I'm like out and about, or, like on the plane or in a hotel, I'm like, I'm right. Like, not having, and also like, why the fuck does a tea bag need to have natural flavors in it? But yeah, the natural flavor thing, I'm like, is there beaver anus in my tea right now that I do not know about? (laughs) Yeah. And so it's terrible. And you know, the part of the problem too, is that we are getting so far away from real whole foods in their natural state that we have to like overload our taste buds with all these crazy flavorings and salt and fat and sugar and all this stuff. Whereas like what happened to just enjoying a simple strawberry that tastes really good. We're forgetting what real food actually tastes like because we're loading up all of our food with all these different flavorings and stuff. And like you said, tea doesn't need to have natural flavor in there. No, like it's so bizarre. Um, Okay. So anything else that we should be looking out for in our food? Yeah. So I always tell people to be mindful of the sugar. Sugar is a big one. And they've been sneaking in into our food since like the eighties because of the low fat movement that was spurred. Um, and I, I want to drop this really fast because a lot of people don't know this. And I think it's really important because it gives a lot of history into, especially the, the diet culture in America in the seventies, there was a study done with Harvard scientists and they were trying to get to the root of what is causing cardi- cardiovascular disease. What they found was that it was sugar that was leading to heart disease. Now the sugar industry got wind of this and they paid these Harvard scientists off to say that it was fat. Now I know this may sound like a conspiracy, but NPR actually reported this maybe five years ago or something. They have a paper trail that's actually happening. And what happened is, you know, they reported their findings and then cue the low fat movement, which we are still seeing the detrimental effects of to this day. I still see Mm. people saying, I'm trying to eat low fat. I'm avoiding fat because I don't want to get fat. Fat does not make fat. Sugar does. 
People don't realize that. It's like you being inflamed, your body being sick. That is what makes you fat. Like your body having fuel and ha- like I I always try and simplify it of if it came from nature and if you could make it at home, like you could make olive oil at home, but like fuck doing that, then it's not going to make you fat. You know, like even, okay, so even CRT chips, addicted. I'm like, if I really wanted to, I could make those bloody cassava chips at home, never going to, but I could do it because I know every single ingredient and I could put the effort in and it does not require like mass machinery. If you can't make it at home, then donate it. Like a Twinkie, like someone's not picking up the package and going, oh, um, there's all these preservatives in here. Like, let me just buy these at the grocery store. So that's one of my top tips is I'm like, if you look at a packaged food and you're like, oh, I recognize all these ingredients and I could technically buy all these ingredients at the store, then this is fair game. But when we start getting into trouble is when you're looking at the ingredient label and you're going, what the fuck is TBHQ and where would someone source this? Like, okay, what is TBHQ? (laughs) So it's a, a widely used preservative. Um, I, I'm trying to think of all the places. I know for sure that I've seen them in Cheez-Its. Okay. And it's linked to gastro upset. And it's also linked to colon cancer in some studies. And it's just, it's a preservative. And that, again, you know, it comes back to what I was saying earlier is that people really need to wrap their brains around the fact that these companies are producing these foods not with human health in mind. They're producing these foods with profit in mind. They want to make these foods as addictive and as um, shelf stable as possible, because think about it, they want their products to be able to sit on the shelves for as long as possible without going bad. And they want you also addicted to it because the more addicted you are to the food, the more you're gonna buy it and you're just gonna house it all the time. But unfortunately that is not what's good for us. Um, Food needs to go bad. You don't wanna have a bag of chips that's on your counter for three months that doesn't mold. That's disgusting. So wait, this is a funny story. So. I like make bread, like almond flour bread. And um, when my fiance and I were first dating, he used, he told me once, he's like, your bread goes moldy quickly. And I thought that that meant that it was like unhealthy because it went moldy quickly. And I thought because bread would stay, like the longer that it would stay fresh, the healthier it was. Like, I thought that was the, like, that's what made me know that it was fresh. And I'm like, oh honey like no that's not how it works but anyway on the oh yeah you want to say something well i was going to say that's one of the main differences between us and like let's say europe for example because mm-hmm. in europe they value going to the market almost every day here in the u.s yep. it's like go to costco load up get three yep. works three weeks worth of food that doesn't go bad whereas in europe it's a ritual where you go to the market in the morning you it get your is. Food for the day right and we've lost we've lost that value on our food we have, and you know, what's funny that you say that I've got a friend in Paris and, um, she used to live in Canada and she was like explaining to me the difference. She's like, one of the things that I just love is that the fridge is never full. The food never goes bad. She's like every mm-hmm. evening after I come home from work, I get my like grocery bag and I go, I walk to the end of the block where I have my butcher, my fruit and veggie guy and like anything else that she needs. She only buys what she needs for dinner. They eat it all never too much, never not enough. They eat it all. And that's it. And every night that's what they do. And in the morning she'll walk to the bakery, she'll get some fresh bread and she'll bring it home. And everything is fresh. And like the bread is warm. We, we don't have that. Yeah. We don't have that in, in, um, the States. So you were saying before, um, about the like addictiveness and everything of like the preservatives. I'm just quickly interrupting myself to talk about the program that every woman needs to do. If you want to understand your cycle so well that you can literally be your own doctor, then your perfect period is something that is an essential tool that you need in your toolkit. If you are sick of the PMS, the bloating, the boobs that are so sore you can barely walk, the back pain, the mood swings, the heavy periods, the delayed ovulation, the irregular cycles, the painful periods, the acne, whatever it is, then this program is not only just going to clear those things up, it's also going to teach you what to do in the future if they ever come up again, which for me is priceless because life happens, right? And it's so beautiful that I know my cycle so well that if I get a little bit of a random symptom come up one month, I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Let me reflect on what's been happening. Okay. Yep. All right. I know what to do now to clear this up. And that is power. So you feel connected to your body. It does not make you feel disconnected from your body. Like so many of us 
us feel when we're having these horrendous periods and these bad luteal phases where we feel like our body is broken. We feel like our body is betraying us. It feels very, very frustrated. It feels like we're in our own fucking jail cell. And you get to take the power back and actually bring all that wisdom that is there that women used to know, that we used to harness, and not only embody that for yourself, right? You're not only healing yourself, you're also educating yourself. And that wisdom and that education, not only are you going to benefit from, but also your daughter, your nieces, your friends, your granddaughters. And I just think what a beautiful way to nourish the female lineage. What a beautiful thing to do as a woman today that you're not only helping yourself when you join your perfect period, you're also helping the future women that are coming into your life, whether you have a daughter or whether you will have a daughter or whether your friends will have daughters, nieces, whether they'll be just friends that you can help out when they're going through rough times with their period. Even when you're a grandmother, you can now help your granddaughter. And isn't that just a beautiful way to really harness that powerful feminine energy within us? So if you would like to join Your Perfect Period, the link is below so you can read about it, join and become another one of my beautiful clients that have changed their cycles forever and are forever grateful. All right, let's jump back into the show. I think something that people also don't realize in the US, because Europe, I've witnessed it myself when I was sick in Europe once, is it's all like capitalism. Like the government doesn't actually care about you. It's not preventative health because if the government cared about you, they wouldn't want you sick and they wouldn't want you having to buy pharmaceutical drugs. But it's all just this like perfectly organized cycle. You eat the shit food that's addictive. You keep eating it. It makes you sick. Okay, where do you go? You go to the doctor. The doctor gives you pills that just put a Band-Aid on it but don't actually fix the problem. You stay sick. You keep needing the pills. You keep paying. And it's this vicious cycle. And like even with like um, the increase of infertility, right? It's like, it's perfect. They make you feel like being infertile is a problem. And the only way to deal with it is to go get IVF and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and you pay so much money and it's not working. And there could, there's often like a whole trauma thing associated with it, which is why I hear about it. And it's like, they just keep making money off selling you this idea that you need X, Y, and Z instead of you need to go on a holiday. You need to de-stress. Let's look at your diet. They don't want to tell you that because then they've solved the problem and they're not making any money. Like I always say my job is to make myself redundant because then I know I've done a good job. People yeah. don't like in big farmer and stuff, they don't want to make themselves redundant because then, then you're not going to keep paying them. They lose customers. Look, the unfortunate reality is there's not a lot of money to be made off of someone who's healthy. You know, I only go to the doctor. I don't even know every couple of years because I don't really, I don't have any sort of needs. I'm not on any sort of Same. pharmaceutical drugs, but that's the problem is that they, they create the problem and then they sell you the cure, but the cure is not actually the cure because like you said, it's just putting band-aids over the, the issue. And then on top of that, they're actually lying to you and telling you that you can't fix this and you can't turn it around. They're like, oh, I sorry, know. diabetes too. Like you can't change it. And you'll even go to your doctor and say, well, are there any lifestyle changes I can make? They're like, no, 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 no. You just take this drug for life and you're fine. Um, no, it is 100% a lifestyle driven disease. And let yep. me tell you the majority of the chronic diseases that we are seeing today are 100% lifestyle driven. That means we're not exercising enough. We're not feeling our bodies. And, you know, we forget that when we're dealing with these symptoms, whether um, it's obesity or diabetes or, you know, even things like skin conditions, like psoriasis mm. and eczema, that is our body telling us something. That is our body going, hey, something is out of balance, not working correctly, and we need to remedy it. And this is why I, I'm such a huge proponent for um, preventative medicine and yeah. doctors that are are doing it like integrative and um, why am I blanking on the other name right now? There's integrative, oh, and functional doctors. Because mm -hmm. what they do is they look at the root causes and they try to get to the root of it and try to figure out, well, why is your body? Why, why is your thyroid not functioning correctly? Or why are you exhibiting, you know, the psoriasis or whatever? What's actually happening in your body? Let's yeah. get to the bottom of it. It's so important because even like one of my team members, she told me that the other day, like she, her friend went off the pill because they're trying to have a baby and she went to the doctor and the doctor was like, you have PCOS. And I'm like, and mm -hmm. so she's just like fucking distraught. And I'm like, wait. She probably has post pill PCOS. Like she needs to listen to XYZ podcast. Cause I was just like, wait, this is a fucking joke. Like doctors just, they just like instill fear in you. And it's, it's sad because 
the end of the day, most people go into medical, like go to become a doctor because they want to help, but they think that the only way to help and they're taught the only way to help is to put somebody on a drug. And again, and then we, we trust the doctor, we trust modern science. We think, oh my God, isn't it amazing that we now have a drug for X, Y, and Z thinking it's going to solve the issue, but it's like, no, you have the power to solve the issue. But like you said, it doesn't make you any money. And we were in Greece last year and I got a raging UTI. We flew to Australia Mm -hmm. for 48 hours and then to Europe. So it was like too many hours on a plane. And I got a raging UTI because I couldn't like stay hydrated enough. And the, um, doctor came to our hotel room and he did not want to put me on antibiotics. This is the Greek doctor. He did not want to put me on antibiotics because he's like, no, 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 no. Like you need to fix it with like X, Y, Z, cram me. But I'm like, I've been taking all of it. Like, trust me. I need, like that was that, that there, there are situations. I'm a big believer that we need modern medicine and we need Eastern medicine a hundred percent. But my thing is, is that what we need to do is make it work together. You know? So in that kind of situation, it was like, okay, the antibiotics here, but you need to be doing X, Y, Z, A, B, C to kind of try and like help offset it in a way, you know? And I had a really bad ski accident a while ago. And I remember laying in a hospital bed and wishing that the doctor could give me an Eastern and Western approach because I didn't like, so what I did was I didn't take the painkillers. So I created phantom pain and like that created a whole other host of issues. Mm -hmm. But I, but I didn't, no one told me like, actually you need to take the painkillers for X, Y, and Z, but we're going to do ABC to help your liver and everything. You know what I mean? Like there was no support like that. So it was like, I'm just going to take as least as like as, um, as few drugs as possible, but then I almost did more damage for myself than goodness, you know? So, um, it's just really like, we need to not just be doing the band aid approach. There is a place for those things, but if you're not fixing the root at the same time, you're not actually solving anything. Yeah. The problem is, is that we're, we're stuck in a really interesting place, um, with our healthcare and our doctors and the way that we're approaching medicine right now. My mom and I were actually talking about this yesterday because you look back to like, for example, when our grandparents were kids and the way that doctors were treating patients was very similarly to how I now say that we should be having this approach where there was more ancient wisdom in there. Right. And they were looking Mm. more to the root cause and they were um, oh, you have a cough, Let, let's give you this honey syrup. And, you know, there were, there were yeah. other more natural interventions there. And of course, like you said, this is not to shit on modern medicine. We wouldn't be here today without antibiotics. So I am by yeah. no means vilifying it. But what has happened is we have allowed big pharma to completely overtake this, big pharma and insurance. And, you know, there's a, there's a big connection between big pharma and insurance companies. They all pay each other. They're all scratching each other's backs. And Big Pharma writes all of the the literature for all the doctors now. And what's happening at the moment is that these doctors are, they're only being taught how to treat their patients simply by symptoms and then giving them a pill to cover up the symptom. Mm. And this is, again, not also not to vilify doctors, but they're not even being taught how to treat their patients from a more natural preventative way because they, so they don't even know how to do this either because also our health has significantly declined in the last 50 or 60 years. We have gone completely downhill. And the the main driver of disease in this country now is chronic diseases that are lifestyle and diet driven, like I said before. So they haven't even been able to catch up to what is happening right now. Whereas before our doctors were very much, um, you know, if you broke an ankle or you had a bacterial infection, it was like, oh, you know, we're gonna go in and we're gonna fix that. It was very Mm -hmm. acute care. But the problem is, is that now it's switched and people are less dealing with acute issues and it's more chronic conditions that are 100% driven by our food system that are all in bed together. You know, big pharma, Mm -hmm. big food, big agriculture, thanks to lobbying and all the money because they make a lot of money off of us, unfortunately. And so these doctors, a lot of them, while they really genuinely want to help their patients, they don't know how because they were not taught how to um, to help these patients with these chronic diseases that have only more recently really proliferated our country thanks to our declining nutrition in our food. It's crazy. I know. And then you go to other countries and it's just like, that's why people are like, why can I eat all the pasta in Europe? I'm like, oh my God, we all need to bloody move to Europe basically. Yeah. So what are some things about the US that we need to take extra steps with because the food stand is, is lower and just things are more like disguising? Yeah. So unfortunately, the number one thing is you have to eat organic. Unfortunately, if you are mm. eating conventional food, it means that you're eating poisoned food. It just is. We, 
we have a, a very widely used herbicide called glyphosate. You may also know it, know it as Roundup. And people use this in their homes, although more recently they, they just placed a ban on it. So I can't remember when, but soon you won't be able to buy it anymore for um, personal use. But we're still using it wide scale on all of our agriculture. And why we thought this was a good idea from the beginning, who knows? Uh, but glyphosate is the most widely used herbicide, and we are spraying it on wheat before it's being harvested to dry it out, meaning that they spray it to dry out the wheat and then they harvest it. So it is being sprayed on it and then directly being put into our foods, um, like our wheat bread or whatever. So it's incredibly important to be eating organic wheat. And organic food has uh, many regulations and laws around what pesticides and herbicides can be sprayed. And people fight me this all the time on Instagram, and they're like, oh, organic doesn't mean no pesticides. Correct. But it means that there's mm -hmm. only a certain amount that are legally allowed to be sprayed on there. And one of them that is not allowed to be sprayed is glyphosate, which we now know is directly linked to cancer. Um, it, I mean, all you have to do is look it up. So Monsanto was originally the company, the big agriculture company that created glyphosate Roundup. Uh, but they were bought out by Bayer, like I think maybe seven or eight years ago now. Bayer is just being... I mean, destroyed in the courts right now in so many litigations. I mean, they're losing millions because all these farmers are now getting crazy forms of cancer from using this glyphosate. So we know wow. that there's a direct connection, not to mention, I know you said earlier, you talk a lot about the gut health connection mm. um, in this country. So we're wondering why everyone's having so many gut issues. Well, glyphosate acts like an antibiotic. What does an antibiotic do? It kills off all the good and bad bacteria. So we're killing off all the good bacteria in our guts, thanks to this glyphosate that we're spraying on everything. And it's having horrendous effects on our health. Oh, <laughs> I just said like, oh my God, like, where does this leave us? Like, we are just fucking doomed, aren't we? Sometimes I literally think, should we just move? Like, should I just fucking move back to Australia or to Europe? Literally, because it is... That is one of the biggest challenges about living here compared to, you know, I lived in London and I also lived in Australia, is the fact that I have to be so anal about my food. And it's like, and I don't, you know, as most women have, like I've gone through my like journey of my relationship with food and I don't want to be anal. Like I don't want to have to be fussy, but I do it out of like deep self-respect for my yeah. body and for the longevity of my, of my life and my health. And, you know, it's obviously really, really challenging, um, living here. So in terms of, uh, like the food, okay. Organic. What about water? What about skincare? Is there anything else, especially living? Oh, and also let's just clarify for people living in Australia and in, um, Europe, as far as I know, glyphosate and those like really bad pesticides are banned. Like in Australia, I never even had to eat, worry about eating organic. They have organic there. Well, at least when I was living there, they would have organic. But what was interesting is that it was never a huge range in a supermarket because normal food was always kind of fine. So um, yeah, like one, uh, like do we need to be worrying about eating organic in Europe and in Australia? And then um, like, yeah, I'll see that one first. Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple caveats that I can say. Also, I want to speak okay. to the U S part of this as well. Um, mm -hmm. you know, what we were talking about earlier, we we've lost our connection to our food and to our farmers, to the, to the people that are growing our food. And part of healing that relationship requires us to get a little bit more in touch with our food again, if you can, I also want to be sensitive mm -hmm. to people, um, living in areas where maybe they don't have access to a farmer's market, but if you have access to a farmer's market, go to the farmer's market and talk to the people growing your food and ask them, do you use glyphosate? What pesticides and herbicides do you use? What practices do you use? And not all of these farms are going to be certified organic and that's okay. It's more about what yes. pesticides we're actually using, right? Because I, so I know it's really important to like understand that being getting that label of organic is very expensive. Very expensive. So I, that I'm this, yeah, if I go to a farmer's market, I don't care about it being organic. I will ask them, about the pesticide situation. And then a lot of times they'll be like, we can't afford the organic thing, but we don't use X, Y, Z. And then I'm like, okay, that's fine. Exactly. And then I was going to say to the point of like Europe and Australia, start if you have access to a farmer's market or, you know, maybe um, I feel like a lot of the markets there are a lot smaller. So they may understand mm -hmm. more about where their food, their produce and stuff is actually coming from. Have a conversation with them and ask them, you know, do you use X, Y, and Z pesticides? Because, you know, in, in Europe and Australia, um, especially with all the different countries in Europe, they all have different mm. regulations about what organic actually okay. means. 
Um, but in, in the U.S., the reason why organic is so important and why I stress it so much is because not only is glyphosate not allowed to be sprayed on there, but there's a very small amount of pesticides and herbicides that are actually allowed to be used. And also there's other farming practices that are protected, like um, in conventional produce, they they sometimes grow in, in sewage sludge. And you're not allowed to do that with organic. Yeah, I mean, it's just awful. There's so many things that happen with our conventional produce. Like I said, like if you're eating conventional produce, at least in the U.S., you were eating poisoned food essentially like just uh, donated been, basically <laughs> yeah it's been toxic sludge you know unfortunately and people people get so mad at me about this but look guys we have to make peace with this is hap this is happening this is the reality yeah. of what is happening right now in the u.s you know and you either stick your head in the sand and go la 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 like i don't want to hear it or be proactive about it you know mm -hmm. um yeah. and then as far as um okay so i just looked this up uh, glyphosate as of 2019 was banned in australia so you don't have to worry about glyphosate in Australia. Great. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Um, there we go. And then I forgot, you asked me something else about your, oh, just if they needed to eat organic as well. Yes. In Australia and Europe. I mean, I would say general practice, it is, um, if you can and you have the access to it, it is more important. But again, it just really comes back to just have a relationship again with your food, have a relationship mm. with people that grow your food or even the markets, you know, like if you live in, in Australia or in Europe, start asking questions like, where do you source yeah. you know, your, where do you grow your vegetables and fruit? Cause that's really more about what it's about really, you know, and what pesticides and herbicides they use, what practices they use, um, get to know your local butcher. It's more about like getting connected again with where your food is coming from. I love that because just like we were talking about on your podcast about like revaluing the feminine, it's like we need to revalue our food. And a lot of us just don't take the time to value where our food's coming from. We don't we don't want to prioritize the time it takes to go to the farmer's market or to do the research. And whilst maybe not everybody can easily access organic food, it's like you, we actually need to value that more and not just think that like our body doesn't care if we just shove shit in our mouths because it does. I mean, this is the very true yeah. essence of our life on this planet. Food yeah. and water is what gives us life. Why have we decided that, oh, we don't even have to worry about it. It's a second thought. Like, oh, I'm just going to drive through a fast food um, thing real fast because I can't be bothered to fucking care it's, about what I put in my body. It, it's crazy. It's so sad. Me. Yeah. It To me, I'm like, I've talked about this before with like relationship with food. I'm like, when you have self-respect, you want to eat good food. You don't, I don't ever have to try to eat healthy. Like I, like someone could, you know, like literally try and force me, feed me something or pay, or like say, I'll pay you a million dollars to eat like, I don't know, McDonald's. And I would be like, no, like I could not bring myself to eat that because of deep self-respect. So on yeah. the note of water, let's talk about water um, in terms of the pharmaceuticals and water, like the, like all that kind of shit, the chlorine and water, fluoride, et cetera. Can you give us a quick, like water for dummies explanation. Okay. So first of all, I think a lot of people don't, don't understand, but they are taking our waste water and uh, filtering it and then adding things like chlorine and fluoride back into it. And then just putting it through the pipes, which by the way, I would uh, encourage everyone listening right now, go Google what tap water pipes look like in the U S because they are so horrifying. <laughs> you're not or maybe like don't not, google it until you can get a water filter and then google it once the water filter is installed <laughs> exactly exactly so and then you know we think like oh our you know our city is um filtering the water and it's totally fine they have these big filtration systems or whatever well they're not filtering for the pesticides that get in it from the farm runoff they're not filtering out the ssris and the birth control that are getting peed out at mass numbers because if you look at the percentage of people in this country that are on SSRIs and birth control and no shade to if you are, but I'm just saying that if you don't want that in your body, then you're going to want a good water filter because it's also these hormones are getting into our water systems. Not to mention, they're also adding back in fluoride and they're adding in chlorine. These are both not great for our body. There is a difference between there. I don't, well, I don't even want to go down this rabbit hole, but if you want to look it up, we don't need as much fluoride as we're getting every single day in our water for healthy teeth. We just don't need it. So, and it's having a detrimental effect on our bodies. And so mm. this is why it is so incredibly important to have a really good water filter. And I encourage everyone listening, definitely do this because um, this will allow you to be a little bit more proactive and give you an understanding of what exactly is happening in your city specifically. You can go to ewg.org, which is environmentalworkinggroup.org. They have a water database where you plug in your zip code 
I'm not sure if they do this in other countries. I can't remember if you can do this in like Europe and Australia. I'm not sure. I'm sure so if maybe- you had a Google, like get resourceful, you'd be able to figure it out. Yeah, in exactly. Other I know for sure in the US that you can definitely plug in your zip code and they will show you all the contaminants and all the levels of the different contaminants in your area. I looked it up. So I recently um, started dating this guy and my boyfriend was drinking tap water and I was like, oh my God, don't drink that. And he's like, no, no, no. Denver is like the cleanest water ever. And I go, oh, watch this. And I plugged in. Was he like code. traumatized? <laughs> I plugged in his zip code and he was like, oh my God. Cause it shows you in real time how many, all these different, cause on top of everything I already mentioned, there's also a lot of heavy metals that are getting into our water. Mm. And it was showing me really high levels of cadmium, arsenic. And I'm talking like 300 times the legal healthy limit. Oh my God. Wait, I need to do this and then show it to my fiance to make him realize because like I have been asking him for weeks to like buy a new fucking water filter for the house because we moved in here and I'm like, I bet you they didn't change it. And like, we don't know when they installed it. And I'm like, I just want a new fucking water filter. Like get me a new water filter kind of thing. But they're obviously like, we have like a water filter for our whole entire house. So they're obviously like kind of expensive. And then we have to get a new one, like replaced for the sink, whatever, like underneath. Cause again, that needs to be replaced. And, um, and he, and he's like, babe, it's fine. Like we can drink unfiltered water for a week. I'm like, no, we cannot. So now I'm on this plane after our interview, I'm literally pulling this up and showing it to him be like, now are we going to get a filter water? <laughs> a water do, filter? It. do not mind me. I'm quickly interrupting the episode for a very, very important reason because you do not want to miss out on this. If you are ready for more, if you are ready to turn your life on, to be in pleasure, to discover your own pleasure, to feel like life is one big giant session of foreplay and to upgrade your wealth frequency, your magnetism, and really feel safe to step into your feminine energy, then you need to join the current round of Queen Alchemy. I'm so excited that we are back with it. This is my renowned program. I've been doing it for, God, I don't even know how many years anymore. Well, a lot. I've been doing it since 2019, right? So however many years that makes it. Um, And this program is unlike anything else out there. So we start the program off by really doing deep healing work, trauma release, somatic release. We heal so many of those wounds that you don't even know exist, right? It is profound, the results that women get from just the first week, from the first call. It's really quite amazing. So the program is a beautiful combination of timeless pre-recorded content that you get immediately. So as soon as you join, you will then get access to the portal, which you can start doing before we start the live calls, which I always suggest to do because then you're just a little bit ahead, right? Then you will also have with me seven, two hour, sometimes they're like two and a half to three, two hour live healing calls and an additional 14, what I call mini trauma calls. And these mini trauma calls, you can pick and choose the ones that you come to based on the kind of trauma and work that you want to be, that you want to be healing. Plus, There is also a Telegram group for extra support over that seven-week period. And there is hours, about 10 to 15 hours of extra Q&A time that happens in that Telegram group where you send me messages. So you send me like questions and I will often reply with a long voice message that is customized to exactly the question that you're asking. It is the most intimate and revolutionary program that I run and frankly, that I have seen done. It has changed thousands of women's lives. I mean, if you go to my Instagram highlights, I can't even count how many highlights there are now from for Queen Alchemy. There is so many highlights and they are chock a block full of screenshots of testimonials. If you go on the website page, there is so many testimonials there that you actually have to click to go to another website page to see the rest of them because it would slow down the website page so much if they were all on that Queen Alchemy website page. And there are, a, there are all the screenshots. And then there are also a bunch of beautifully written testimonials from previous Queen Alchemy girls. I mean, this program, it sells itself, right? It's speaks for itself. I've talked about it for years. You know whether you want to do this or not. If you are finding that you are in these shitty habits, these bad toxic cycles, you're in bad relationship after bad relationship, you know that you have a pile of wounding and trauma work that you need to be working on. You know that you are, you know, feeling and receiving love in the wrong kind of ways, right? Because that's how your dad gave you love and you are sick of experiencing that. You are going to be getting irreversible results 
as in they are sustainable. So not irreversible in a bad way. They are sustainable results. They are not something that you have to sustain yourself by doing like 10 hundred journaling prompts a year. This is something that because it is based in somatic work, right? Somatic healing, somatic embodiment, this sticks right? We are completely recoding your body in a way where you don't have to think about acting like this new version of yourself. You don't have to think about, oh, I got, I got to embody my inner queen. You just are her, right? It is priceless, this program. The results are absolutely irresistible. And I know so many of you really crave the sisterhood and the depth. And this program is going to give that to you. It is nourishing to our bodies to be in this beautiful container where we are held so deeply by other women, we are seen so deeply by other women. And frankly, I think that Queen Alchemy and many past Queen Alchemy clients will attest to this as well. It is essential for every woman to do this very unconventional and revolutionary program. So if you would like to read more about it, if you would like to secure your space, just look at the link below in this episode um, and you can secure your spot. And of course, if you are wanting to really talk to me, you're unsure about it, you have two options. You can one, book in a 20-minute consultation call with me and we'll chat. The other option is that you can send a DM on Instagram and uh, just let Olivia know that you would love a little voice message from me and some input just to hear my voice and know that I've kind of been filled in on your situation. And I will, of course, shoot you a voice message as soon as I can. So you have those options as well to help you feel really secure and safe in this investment. All right. I will see you in the program. Let's get back to the episode. So sometimes people need to actually see the real data and see, oh my God, in my neighborhood, this specific element that is directly connected to cancer is in 300 times legal limit white water. Not to mention too, I always like to remind people of this, make sure that you're feeding your cats, your dogs, all your pets, the filtered water too, because that also has an effect Mm. on their body. I love that. I love that. So greenwashing. Not everybody knows what greenwashing is. So if you want to quickly explain what it is, and then also, can you share some like clear things to almost look out for, like red flags on a label for greenwashing? Um, and then if you know of any brands, at least in the US, that are people think are like, you know, natural, non-toxic, healthy, but are actually disgusting. Yeah. Oh, I love this conversation. So greenwashing is when a company will depict on the front of their package that their product is really healthy. So think like um, you'll see on the front that it'll show rolling green pastures and chickens laying eggs. And, you know, it, it depicts this picture in our mind, like, oh, this is really healthy and it's natural and it comes from nature. And then you turn around the back and it's like canola oil, processed wheat, you know, just a bunch of crap that shouldn't be in there, mm-hmm. a bunch of preservatives and unnatural, fla- like natural flavorings or artificial flavorings. We always have to remember that the front of the package really doesn't mean anything at all. It's it's just an advertisement. It's like a billboard for that product. Mm. Where all of the truth is, is in the back when you look at the ingredient label. So you always have to look at the back. And a perfect example of a company that does this is Beyond Meat. Um, Beyond Meat or Impossible Burger. They depict on the front that it's, you know, green and natural. And, and they'll even say terms on there like natural or, you know, plant-based protein or whatever it is. People think like vegan equals healthy. Like, no, vegan is not equal healthy. Exactly. It can be, but just Mm. because a product says natural on there, or just because it says vegan or Or gluten-free, gluten-free is another really big one too. It's like, there are these words that we automatically associate with being healthy, but French fries are vegan, you Mm. know, like you can't just go by that label. And a lot of these labels are not even regulated terms. Like for example, natural is not a regulated term. Like organic is a regulated term. We know we see organic on the label on the front, that there are certain things that this company had to go by legally in order to get that stamp on the front of their package. Things like natural are not regulated. So a company could say our product is natural and then have, you know, all these preservatives in there that are completely like a bunch of soy and shit like Beyond Meat has like, and what's that other egg one? It's like a new egg thing and it's like in a carton and it is fucking like anyone that eats that. I'm like, oh God help you. Like, honestly, I'm like, it is disgusting it's horrifying i think it's called just egg i mean talk about having that's right it's not just egg though it's like it's like a tiny bit of egg and then a pile of shit oh there's it has like canola oil in it oh there's no egg yeah there's no egg in that one because it's a vegan egg product just eat the real honestly (laughs) i know when i'm always like if if you are trying to get like a vegan meat thing, I'm like immediately no. Like even in a restaurant, I'm like, oh, it's vegan cheese. I'm like, no thanks. Take that one off. 
because you know it's like soy or like a bunch of shit and canola oil etc in terms of greenwashing um courtney what about some uh like soaps uh laundry detergent like i feel like those ones that we, we really think it's we really don't know because it's all a bunch of like chemical terms that we don't know anyway so we don't know the ones that are actually okay and the ones that are not okay you know what i think is so funny is i've seen before on the front of like like laundry detergent for example or dish soap it'll say plant-based and i'm like what 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 that doesn't mean anything or another great one in skincare is it'll say cruelty free look Uh, we all want our skincare to be cruelty free okay and we all want our makeup to be cruelty free of course that's a great thing but people automatically associate with cruelty free as being healthy and good for us but that that does not mean anything at all mm. we so our our makeup and our skincare are completely unregulated companies can put whatever the fuck they want in those products and it does not matter because for some reason we've gotten in our minds that if we put it on our skin, that it's not going to get into our body. Our skins are our largest organ. Everything that we put on our skin eventually goes through our skin and it gets into our bloodstream. And the problem with this is women more specifically are susceptible to to this because of all the products that we use. Think about everything we use on a day-to-day basis, lotion, perfume, all the different makeup, makeup products, the concealer, the blush, the bronzer, the foundation, um, the body wash and shampoo that we're doing. I mean, on average, women are putting 160 different chemicals in their body just based on what they're putting on their face and on their bodies through oh, all these wow. products every single day. And the problem is, is that we have no idea what's happening when all these different chemicals are working in conjunction in the body. They're all like, we don't know the drug reactions to all these different mm. chemicals going in the body. And so this is a really big concern, especially when it comes to fertility because a lot of these chemicals have been found to be what's called endocrine disrupting. Our endocrine system is a very delicate balance of hormones in our body. And when we're disrupting our endocrine system, it can lead to hormonal imbalances. And when our hormones are off, we really struggle with our fertility. Not to mention, um, it also plays a role in thyroid issues, in cancer, in autoimmune issues. And you know, so we're wondering why so many women are struggling with fertility and why so many of us are sick it's because we're slathering 160 different chemicals on our body every single day. It's crazy. It is it is fucking crazy. And for anyone listening, like I talk about it all the time, but Credo in the US like has been such a lifesaver for me. Right. I, but I, I will still check like every ingredient, even from Credo before I buy it. Um, Cause there's some products where I'm sometimes like, really? Like that must've like just gone through. And my makeup artist, um, she works like quite head up, like quite far up in, um, in Credo. And sometimes I'll be like, how the fuck did that product get through? And she's like, they just made it. And I'm like, yeah, no, thank you. But it's like, it's effort to have to, you know, work at that every day, especially when, you know, especially in America, it's just harder to come across really good brands and they're up and coming, which is amazing. It's just harder to come across really good brands that are non-toxic. And I think a lot of people think that they don't do as good a job. Like natural laundry detergent isn't going to do as good a job as like some fucking Tide. And I'm like, let me tell you, that Tide is giving me an allergic reaction from just sitting in the cupboard. (laughs) Oh my God. I can't even do it. I, I had to get rid of my boyfriends because anytime I was sleeping in a sheets, like my, I, my skin gets yep. itchy and I get yep. migraines yep. from the smell. Um, yep. you know, I mean, it's awful. That stuff is awful. Look, let me tell you, I've been doing this for a long time because I, my mom was the one that got me on all this like 15 years ago. And I use all non-toxic makeup, skincare, uh, laundry detergent. I found amazing products that really work. Branch basics is a great one. Yeah. Um, there's another company called Dirty Labs that makes a non-toxic one. Levant makes great mm-hmm. non-toxic dish and um, laundry detergent, also dish soap and uh, hand soap. There is a lot of really amazing companies that are making really effective products. And um, a great resource, if you have stuff that you're unsure of, if it has like toxic ingredients in it that are affecting your body, EWG that I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. there's such a great resource for, resource for everything. Um, EWG.org has a database called Skin Deep, and you can go in there and you can type in um, whatever product you're wondering about, like your Tide or, um, I don't know, Mrs. Meyer's laundry detergent or whatever it is that you use, and it will tell you all the contaminants in there and it will rate it based on all the contaminants in there, how healthy or unhealthy that product is for you. 
I love it. And like Myers is a, another one, right? If I'm correct, that it's like greenwashing. Everybody thinks it's like healthy and non-toxic, but actually it's not that great. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, yeah. there are, there are companies that, yeah, they do the greenwashing where they try to sell us that it's really healthy. And then you go and you look up all the ingredients and you're like, this is actually not that good for us. They're yeah. duping us because I want to make money. They are. Exactly. It's all just like a fucking capitalism money making scheme. And it's like we have to we have to fight back in the way of like not giving in, essentially. It's like that's the most powerful thing to do, right? Is like stop buying the products, go to the farmers market more, support small businesses that are doing the right things, because then hopefully sooner or later our children won't be growing up in the same kind of toxic environment that we're growing up in. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Connie, what are like three things that you feel like everybody needs to be doing? And because my audience doesn't like general shit, neither do I, you know this about me now, is like what would be some beyond the basics? Like we know the gut health, balance your hormones, like we know we know all those things. What would be some specific things that most people don't know would have a really big impact on their physical health, um, especially in the US? I would say number one, this is probably going to shock a lot of people eat more meat. We are not eating enough meat anymore because everyone's being pushed this narrative that plant-based is healthy for us. I want to be sensitive to people that are listening that are plant-based and they feel great. They're thriving. Their blood work is amazing. They don't have vitamin deficiencies and they feel really good. Amazing. I love this for you. And I truly applaud you for it. But unfortunately we're being sold a lie that plant-based works for every single human there are so many different factors involved in people's health. One of them being that um, many people have genetic mutations that literally do not allow them to convert certain foods and get the bioavailable nutrients, amino acids, certain things like B12 out of their food. And so while we are being told that you can get B12 out of certain vegetables and it's really high in X, Y, and Z that's plant-based, this is not necessarily true for every single person. And I can tell you personally, as someone who is vegetarian for five years, I was so incredibly sick by the end of it, mm. but I kept telling myself, I can't do this. Um, it's unethical. I can't kill another animal. There was almost this like martyrdom there, right? Where I was mm. like, their life over mine. It is the biggest act of self-love and self-care to feed yourself nourishing foods that you know are going to nourish your body. And unfortunately, I encourage people to um, check out, there's a, a woman, Diana Rogers, she was on Joe Rogan's podcast like last year, and she has an account called Sustainable Dish. She talks about this all the time. There is no such thing as a bloodless diet. People that are eating vegetarian mm. are still contributing to the killing of millions of animals a year. All of the, the reindeer, the snakes, the gophers, um, the insects, the bees that are getting killed just because of our mass farming um, in the United States. So unfortunately, none of us are getting away with, uh, with animals not being killed, you know? And unfortunately, um, this is where I get a little spiritual with this. We have to make peace with the fact that life on this planet also means death. We have to make peace with the fact. I was about to say, like, there is a fucking life cycle for a reason. God, the universe, whatever you believe in, like, how is it we allow ever? How is it we'll watch David Attenborough and we are okay with that life cycle, but we don't realize that, like, it's like we've become so entitled as humans that we've forgotten that we are an animal. Like, yeah. we have to eat, and we are meant to eat other animals. Yes, yes. And again, like I said earlier, you know, it, there are some people that that really do well and they yeah. thrive really well. And I don't want to discount that. Um, and this is by no means meant to shame anyone. Like I said, I was vegetarian for five years. And when a nutritionist, when I was basically dead, sitting in her office crying, cause I was so sick, she looked me dead in the eyes and she goes, you have to start eating meat. And I mm. stopped the whole drive home. And I was like, that bitch, how dare her <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Like I will never eat meat, but it took me getting so incredibly sick. So inflamed, mm. so bloated. I was just I had cystic acne all over my chin. And guess what? All of it went away when I started eating meat, meat because my mm. body was literally starving for it. Because unfortunately, um, meat is the only food as grass fed is what I really um, am a huge proponent for, but grass fed beef specifically, if you were to eat nose to tail, a cow, you would get every single bioavailable nutrient that the human body needs. And you cannot say that about any other food on the planet. So we've been wow. sold a lot of healthy for us it is incredibly nourishing for our bodies. And especially with women, I think because we are more empathetic, we are more empathetic to the killing of animals. We eat less mm. meat because of that. 
but I would encourage women for your fertility, for your overall health, for your vitality. I look at photos of myself from when I was vegetarian. I looked dead. My skin was dull. I was really mm -hmm. like, oh, I was inflamed. I was puffy. And I yeah. didn't have vitality in my skin. I lost all my vitality. And but like, obviously everyone, it's really important. You know, this grass fed, grass finished needs like pasture raised, organic chicken, et cetera. Like it needs to be good quality, but I can yes. attest to this as well. Like when I moved to, from London to the U S and even a bit in London, I found it really hard, um, to get really good quality meat easily. And it's only been recently that I've like found the farms, got it delivered, but living in an apartment in New York, it was kind of hard sometimes to get things delivered. So I was eating less meat not because I was choosing to, it was just really hard for me to find really good quality meat. Whereas in Australia, it's just like, fucking go to the butcher and it's there. Um, and I had less energy. And then I realized just after a little bit like, oh, I need to eat more meat. As soon as I ate more meat, like it is such an important thing. And what a lot of people don't realize also that I know you speak about is the whole thing of, you know, animals use so much water, like they're like us eating animals is killing the earth. Like it's more regenerative to like, you know, be vegan, blah, blah, blah. If that's your argument, like you need to critically think because it's actually not the case. And again, it's a big fat lie because just like you were saying, if you're vegetarian, well, now we have to have all this space to grow all these crops to feed you. And that needs more water than a cow needs. Exactly. This narrative that the vegetarian, vegan, plant-based lifestyle is going to save the environment is actually so incredibly false. I can't even tell you. I encourage everyone to watch the film, Kiss the Ground. There is an entire life cycle uh, that happens in nature that requires animals as part of this life cycle. And we need to get back to more regenerative farming, which is working with nature instead of against her. Right now we're working against nature by tilling the land. We're spraying it to high hell with pesticides and killing off the ecosystem killing the precious soil where our food grows. And as a result, our food does not have as much nutrients. And what's happening is we're planting all these plants in what's called monocrop. So what I said earlier, the wheat, the soy, the corn, what's monocrop? When you, were, when you drive past a farm and you see just rows and rows and rows of the exact same crop, that's a monocrop. And that is one of the things that is having the most detrimental effect on our environment because it's also messing with the weather, weather patterns. Because alternatively, when we're not tilling the land and we're allowing bi biodiversity of the land, um, where all these different plants are growing in the same space, it's feeding the soil. And then what happens is the soil pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. So it has a, an exact opposite effect. So we're actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere when we allow nature to do her thing as nature intended. Whereas vice versa, if we're eating plant-based and we're, you know, we're eating these impossible and beyond burgers and saying, oh, this is helping the environment and helping the planet. All we're doing is putting more money into the very mm. thing that is causing climate change in the first place. Oh it's God. So I just, awkward. I feel like the message for everybody, and this is like goes with literally everything. I'm like, think critically. Like, don't, don't think that like by doing something, cause it's a trend, like you're now a better person, like get out of the virtue signaling, like actually think critically of, is this smart? Like make an educated choice for yourself. Don't think that because some, someone said one thing off Instagram, it's the truth because yeah. most of the time it's actually not. And like, at the end of the day, why would marketing want us, like we talked about before to be healthy? Why, like, they want to sell this narrative so that we all stay in fear, so that we just bow down to them. Exactly. You know, it's all Hopefully. just a money making thing. Yeah, it's all about making money. And then I'll, I'll lead this into the second one that I was going to say yeah. is that eat more real food. And this, you know, look back to what have humans been eating for thousands of years? It's very basic meat, eggs, dairy. Obviously, if you have an intolerance to one of these things, don't eat it because that means that your body can't digest it. But for the most part, like most of us can eat these very natural foods that we've been eating forever, right? So we have to look mm. to the history and the longe longevity of things because that is what humans have been subsisting on for thousands of years. Butter. We've been vilifying butter. Well, guess what? Yeah. About 50 years ago, we told everyone that margarine was healthier, healthier for them. Turns out that it was literally the worst fat it is so bad that it is one of the only times that USDA has actually intervened and banned something from the food system, which is trans fats. We told I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. We told everyone to replace their butter, which is something that humans have been eating for thousands of years with this margarine. And it killed so many people. 
we have to look to the longevity of these things. Again, how long have people been eating plant-based bur- burgers? Five years, 10 years? Like mm-hmm. I'm not talking about like beans and legumes. Like if you make them at home, that's a different thing. When I say plant-based yeah. burgers, I'm talking about specifically these man-made Franken foods that we've only been eating for what, like seven years versus and we've they're been not eating these. <laughs> they're terrible for us. So yeah. if you have any questions about it, look to what humans have been eating for a very long time. And that's the answer. So I would say number two would be eat more real food. Um, and then the third one, I would say, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are talking about this right now, but for good reason, I would just say, make sure you're eating enough protein. Protein mm. is what keeps us satisfied and full for longer. And this is truly what you want. You want to be satisfied and full after a meal. So you're not just chasing snacks all day. Cause not only is oh it Oh my good- God, that whole like eat till 80%. I'm like, no, don't do that. Because then you think about food for the next four hours and that's exactly. what creates an unhealthy relationship with food. And then you fucking snack, eat till you're full. You will not think about food anymore. You'll be able to focus on what you need to focus on. And then you'll notice when you get hungry again in the future and then you just eat again, like not a big deal. <laughs> exactly. And protein <laughs> is very satisfying and very filling. And so is good, healthy fats avocado, mm. a good fatty salmon, um, nuts, almond butter, uh, olive oil, olives, really good healthy fats are also really good for us. And again, they create that satiety, which means that you're going to be fuller for longer. And then you're not going to be chasing snacks all day. There's no problem with like snacking a little bit here and there. But if you are constantly feeling hungry and having to snack every hour, your blood sugar is going to be all over the place. You're going to be starving all day. And then you're just going to be mindlessly eating. Amen. And let me just say, like, I fucking love olive oil and I drown my food in that shit. When my fiance met me, he's like, he, he, cause he, it was all very new to him. So he was like, that's like, that's unhealthy, babe. Now he's like, can you load on more olive oil, please? We go through so much olive oil in this house because I just, I love it. It's so good for you. And it just tastes good. Like why use that fucking seed oil shit? It tastes disgusting and it's bad for you. So like, you don't get anything out of it. Anyway. Courtney, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom, your guidance, your expertise. I'm sure everybody has just loved this episode. Um, what is your Instagram handle so that people can tag you can like in, when they share the episode so that they can find you and watch all your videos and just continue to soak up your goodness? Yeah, so you can find me Real Foodology across the board. I'm Real Foodology on Instagram and also on TikTok. And then I also have a podca- podcast called Real Foodology. Amazing. Thank you all so much for listening and I will see you next week. Oh my goodness, you guys, that was such a juicy episode with Courtney. I cannot wait for this to be released. I hope that you learned a ton from this episode because I mean, there is hope, but you need to educate yourself when it comes to health. And let's remember that health is the whole spectrum, right? It is mindset. It is energetic. It is physical. It is all of it. So make sure that you are supporting your body and respecting your body on every single level. If you need any episode recommendations for your health journey, if you go to the podcast directory, you will find a whole giant directory, as as it sounds, of the different episodes grouped into the different categories so that you can go and find other episodes that could be really helpful to you, whether it's weight loss stuff, whether it's energetic weight, whether it's um, skin health, gut health, hormones, all those beautiful things. I also want to share with you guys that I did an epic episode with Courtney that is on her podcast now. So we'll put the link below so you can also go check out that episode. It was really, really, really great. So she asked some epic questions and we talked about some things that I haven't actually spoken about on podcast interviews before. So I think you guys would get a lot of benefit out of it. And just please make sure that you share the episode, that you tag Courtney, that you tag myself so we can repost it and share the love and whatnot as we spent two hours recording these episodes for you guys. So we would really appreciate that little value exchange. I will see you guys next week on the podcast and have a lovely rest of your day.